And now for something completely different, um, I'd like to invite um, Gary Charnock, who has uh, had the idea and has um, led uh, Ashton Hayes going carbon neutral. Gary. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, so it is completely different, this, to previous stories. Uh, I just would like to just tell you a story of a village that tried to do something about climate change. And um, the story starts back in 2005 when I went to the Hay Book Festival. And at the festival there was a debate by um, the head of Shell, chairman of Shell, Lord Oxborough, and Sir David King, who was then the government chief scientist. And they were talking about what industry could do to help alleviate climate change but also what the government could do. And it was a very interesting debate. Um, and at the end, they turned to the audience and said, what, what, what are you going to do? You, we're going to do something. Well, what are you going to do when you leave this room? So it occurred to me, and I thought, well, how, how can an individual do something about climate change? When you, when, uh, you can see why a company can do something. So I went, I went out, and I thought about this for a while. Um, and I was actually walking on Shetland Islands one day, um, and it just sort of occurred to me, could... Could the village where I've lived for 30 years attempt to become carbon neutral? Because I know the place, it's quite a friendly place, people have lots of theatre clubs and gardening clubs, could we get together and do something? So I got back to Ashton, which is, um, I'll just show you where it is. Um, Ashton is uh, a village in Cheshire, east of Chester, and I went, I went straight down to the local pub, which is this thing here, to the pub quiz, and I said to a few of my friends, would it be completely ridiculous to attempt to be a carbon neutral village and I thought they'd all think I was a complete nutcase actually um, but they said no that's a good idea why don't you if you if you get it going we'll support it and one of my friends was from the University of Chester and he said if, if you can get this going the University of Chester will actually help you by uh, studying what we do I thought that's a good idea um, but I didn't want to just say a bunch of us a bunch of people in the pub we're going to start off on a carbon neutral project. So as a citizen, I asked the parish council if I could have 10 minutes slot on the parish council. And you're all entitled to do that. So I wasn't in any council. I've never stood up before in the community, but I thought, I'm going to ask for 10 minutes. So I presented to, on a cold night to the parish council saying, I think we should attempt to become England's first carbon neutral village. And the parish council looked completely bewildered because they normally think about potholes and, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, street lamps and things like that. Um, uh, but actually, somebody from the university came and somebody from Energy Saving Trust came to support the idea. So I was then sent out the room, and the Paris Council voted on this concept, would we become a carbon neutral village? And I came back and they said, well, we will agree to it on condition that you take up the vacant seat on the Paris Council. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think was the real reason they did it, actually. So I said I'd do that. And, I also, and they also said, you've also got to prove to us that the community will support this because there's only about five people in the audience, as, you, as at every parish council, there's only five people in the audience. Um, would, you hold a, would you hold a village meeting in a month to say that pe to show people who would, who would be interested? So I agreed that. And I also agreed, which they're pleased about, that we would never, ever spend a penny of the parish council precept in doing the project. So they had no risk. I was running it, I'd taken up a free seat, and no money was being spent. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Um, the idea was that we were going to try and become the first small community in England and the real reason was we wanted that to, to say to our children and future generations that we tried to do something. It was nothing more than that really um, and we hoped that other people might follow us and, and one of the things we said about the project, whatever we do we'll give it free to everybody else. So when, when you start a project like this, you've no money, right? So how are you going to get people behind it? How are you going to pay for things? So uh, the day after the Paris Council meeting, I got on the phone to all these different organisations and I asked if they could help. Within two days, I had cheques for £3,600 and company directors saying, not only will we help, we'll actually give you staff, we'll give you, we'll give you boards to put up, we'll do printing, we'll do newsletters for you. Well, amazing, really. And I said, why did you want to do this? He said, because all our staff are keen to do something about climate change, and this is one way we can support you. So that was really good. So with the £3,600, we could afford to make these signs, uh, that was some of the money, to make these road signs, we're saying, aiming to be England's first carbon neutral village. We put these up on a foggy Sunday morning. That's my friend who's Professor Alexander from the University of Chester. We put these up. We didn't get permission to put them up. Um, and, we put, and people started to drive past and say, what's going on? We'd already announced it, but it reminded motorists that something was going on, and it got people talking. Then the highways rang us up. Oh, I'll tell you about that in a minute, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we, we decided that we'd have this meeting within a month's time, 
Now, why did we say aiming to be England's carbon neutral village, first carbon neutral village? My background is I'm an engineer, but I've also been a journalist for a long time, engineering journalist. And I knew that one of the things we didn't have was cash to promote this project. The only way we could get people behind it was to get it in the press. Putting a headline like that on a story is a one way to get a story in the press. Whether you're going to achieve it or not, it's a great way to get a story. So we, went, we took out the local newspaper editor for lunch and he agreed to run stories about the project. And I knew if we could get the headline in local newspapers, London newspapers, the national newspapers, always read the local newspapers for stories. And I knew they might pick this up. So I went out in the, na in the local newspaper and within probably a week, we have phone calls from all over the place, even BBC, Northwestern, and Granada Television, who said, can we come to the village? So it worked in the sense of being a catalyst for getting publicity. And the reason I did that was not because I wanted publicity just for the project. It was because people in Ashton had done a survey a few years back and said, and the survey said, how do you like to get your news? And, this, and it concluded that 57% of people in Cheshire, actually, wanted to get their news from local newspapers and the local press. So I figured that was the best way to get the news out. So people really started chatting about this, and um, we chose the primary school as the, as, as the place to hold the first meeting. And one of the things I'd learned, I've been working in, in refugee camps in various places, slums in India in my past life, and um, what I noticed is you can get children involved in projects. It really is a catalyst for bringing parents and brothers and sisters and grandmas and grandpas to meetings. So the children made an exhibition of vehicles of the future. And the other reason for that is because climate change is not visible. You can't see it. But if you start to do things that are visible, it starts to remind people. So the kids drew all these vehicles. And I knew when, the, when the, this is uh, BBC Northwest tonight coming, they had somewhere to film and they could interview the children. And it was a very, very good way. So if you ever do a community project, getting the primary school involved is a, to get the community motivated. Um, so we also then had this meeting a month later, and it was minus two on a Thursday night at 7.30, and we thought nobody's going to come. And we actually got 400 people, which was three quarters of the adults coming out, and this is half of them because we, we, we're exceeding the health and safety regulations <laughs> for the school room, and the other half are in classrooms waiting to do the second show. Um, and to keep them happy, we'd actually, with some of the money from business, we bought champagne, English champagne from Kent, which has improved because of climate change. So we, 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 gave, we gave everybody bottles of champagne to keep them occupied while we had this meeting. And, and we just explained, and the WI made apple pie and things for everybody and whatever. And we explained what we were doing. And there's this chap arrived with a microphone. And this chap didn't tell us, but he was from BBC World Service. He said, could I just record it? And he actually broadcast it to 12 million people. <laughs> so we were suddenly thrust into the limelight with all this. But what we said to people was, we don't want you to spend money on renewables. We don't want suddenly all these little B&Q wind turbines on roof. We want you to see, can we change our behaviours as a community? Can we save energy? That's what Peter was talking about. So we, the University of Chester explained uh, what was going on, and we were going to do a survey every year. And the university sent students in for six weeks a year to live in the village and go around to people's houses and do a full survey, individual survey. Um, and this was really good because the survey was very useful to get the data, but it was also very useful to educate people what we were doing. So people went off and, and were given this results. In the meantime, for some reason, I don't know why, in 2006, it became very popular. I think it had been on the World Service and that got around. So we had a string of newspapers and TV companies uh, coming from far away as New Zealand and Canada, probably it's not good for the carbon footprint, but anyway, they were coming that way to interviews. And the Financial Times came for a week. That's what was very interesting. They said, we think this could be a thing for the future. And they did a five-page feature on Ashton Hayes, which was fantastic for the businesses that had supported them, because we said to businesses, if you give us cash, whenever we can get publicity, we will do. So all the business leaders were interested in the FT. And some of the life's ambition was to get in the FT, actually. So they were very happy. Um, <laughs> So having, having the publicity was really great because people felt very proud of the village as well. And I think keeping, this, keeping a TV company coming in is a big thing for kids and teenagers and they have a big satellite truck. So we had a list of people in the village who were doing things about energy saving. And we said to them all, uh, would you be prepared to be interviewed on television or in the newspapers? And they all agreed and signed up. And so when the TV company came, we just... We said, you've got to interview these people. And we went through a list of people. So probably 30 houses were on different television television stations, French radio, whatever. 
Um, and they liked that because they all felt involved. And I think giving people a bit of reward and a pat on the back is very important. And the press was really useful to us for that. Right. So there were, anyway, there were one or two people who weren't very keen on the project. They thought it was ridiculous. And one of them was Barry, the publican. And he thought we were completely stupid and why we were bothering. And we'd ha one of the things we started off with was we had a group of 20 or 30 people very keen, but we had no structure apart from just reporting to the Paris Council. And um, they said, what are the rules? What rules are we going to have? So we actually formulated eight rules, but there were two particular rules that would have been really useful. And one was we do not allow politicians to address our meetings. <laughs> Um, so we had people like Hilary Benn and Claire Short arriving in the village to sort of address us and we said well you can't, we don't allow it and they were so frustrated because they had to sit in the audience and they could ask questions but they could never stand up at the beginning because our view was we didn't want politics to enter this debate and we also felt politics was a bit short term with the four year you know, that things change all the time and we wanted this to be a long term thing but actually the journalists loved this they loved the fact <laughs> that politicians were ignored because we wanted to do this ourselves and the second thing was we don't argue with anybody. So if you've got someone in the village, you're all living together, you definitely, the last thing you want to do is have a fall out with somebody. So um, we said, if somebody starts to argue and disagrees with what we're doing, we'll say, that's fine, you can do what you like, but should you want some help down the future, just give us a shout. Barry was one of these people. He was behind the bar, and one day he came and said, I know I've been telling this is ridiculous. He said, but I can't afford to run the pub anymore because electricity bills are so high. So we, we immediately went, went in and said, do you want some help? And we university did a complete survey of his operations and discovered he was heat cooling the beer in winter and he was already minus one in the cellar. He was still cooling the beer. He was, had his cigarette machines on all night. His chef started the ovens at nine in the morning and only cooked the first meal at 12.15. So within a, a month, he'd saved 200 quid. On, on, that was a, a fifth, I think, or a quarter of his electricity bill. And he became completely com converted from being a net. So he persuaded the football team to car share, got their energy saving <laughs> light bulbs, started putting logs in the fires, and uh, to a point where he, he became quite famous as a publican for trying to be, he tried to be England's first zero carbon pub. <laughs> so <laughs> as a result, we were invited to go to Wembley. To the, we represented Britain at the Live Earth Rock concert. Oh, where's the sound gone? Some people who have done it are the people of Ashton Hayes in Cheshire. Oh, well done, and, uh, well done. Some of them are over here. Uh, hello. Uh, now, you're Gary. It was your idea. That's right. Yes. Uh, you're Barry. Yep. Uh, you're, you live in the village. You run the pub, is that yeah. right? Yeah, I'm on the pub, yeah. And Zach Goldsmith down the end there. Hello. Uh, the editor of The Ecologist. Uh, so how hard was it to convince the people of Ashton Hayes? It was remarkably easy, actually. We, uh, about last January, Jan uh, we... Um, we held a meeting, we said, look, we're very concerned about climate change. Who's up for joining with us to try and make the village carbon neutral? And we had 75% of the adults turn out on a cold January night. And since then, we've just had more and more people, the kids, the local business, the local university helping us. OK, well, there's, a, there's a, a film of what you did, and here's a little clip. If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. Even that bastion of Britishness, the local village pub, has gone green. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our quiz. Right, well, we'll start with the first round of questions. Question one. How many plastic bags are used in the UK each year? Yeah, plastic carrier bags. Go to the nearest million. <laughs> they came to me um, and explained to me, do you want to be the first carbon neutral pub? And I said, I don't know what you're on about. What, what's this one about? What, what, what is this? But when we looked at it, we saved £200 a month on the first month we, we tried to look at something. Question eight. What are the two main greenhouse gases? It's a bit strange now because people are talking about um, climate changes now. It's not talking about... Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Everton, Chelsea, Tottenham, and stuff like that. It's talking about how we can do something with this village, how we can change it. And here's Barry with legs. Uh, so uh, what difference has it made in your life? Is it annoying, kind of, you know, resetting digital clocks all the time and turning off everything? Uh, no, it's quite easy, really. I mean, Gary came to you, I was a bit sceptic. I thought, oh, I can't be bothered with this, you know, it's one of these things. But 
what happened was the University of Chester came and helped me uh, for the day and uh, just by turning stuff off. Listen, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. We're going to come back and talk about this some more with Zach. But for right now, Black Eyed Peas are on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so we got upstage by Black Eyed Peas, but they were going to come back to us because they thought the Black Eyed Peas did so much swearing on the BBC that they'd have to cut them off. So we stood there while they were counting all the swear words they were singing, but they actually very clever, they never, they never did. But the, the important thing about that was that Barry, Barry then got invited by Dutch's, because Dutch's brewery was shown on the rank, he got five day, five star hotel holiday in Edinburgh because of that. <laughs> so he, he was very, he was very chuffed. But the, but the point that was interesting, we didn't argue with Barry at the beginning, we didn't tackle him, we said, at your own pace, and that's really important. Lots of people in the village who perhaps drive really expensive uh, fuel guzzling cars have changed their mind over time. And they've said to us, because you didn't argue, we didn't feel, you know, badly. So uh, the, the six messages we went and we gave evidence to the, uh, for the climate change white paper. We gave evidence in the House of the Parliament uh, and that was recorded, which was, well, again, people coming from the village thought this is a great hoot, you know, here we are going down to the House of the Parliament. We've never done this before. Um, so getting the public engaged and then this measurement by the University of Chester, house to house, was really useful getting all this data. And we've also had lots of visitors, and we've, on our website, we've recorded every meeting we've had for eight years on our website, which is very interesting how it's all progressed. So um, we're now actually on our eighth year into this, and um, we had a baseline survey made, which we, is the baseline for all our calculations. We were given a various bits of cash. We were given um, support from the government. Um, and we, we were very much involved in this uh, low carbon transition plan in the UK. So um, after the first year, the survey revealed that we saved 20% of our carbon footprint. Um, we then held a conference in Chester with 150 communities to share the knowledge of that. Um, and then we started some initiatives, people started putting in solar panels and we had a little miniature wind turbine on the school. And we made a film. One of the things we did was a project. We said to people, um, if you've got a skill and you want to join in, come and use that skill. So one particular guy liked making films. And he made a film right from the beginning. We've done this. This is what I really recommend. We've made five films now. But the first film just interviewed people about why they were joining the project. He submitted the film reluctantly to the, what's called the IBCA Clarion Award, which is a European-wide award on climate change. And we got a call from the South Bank film studio saying, could you bring a coach load of people from Ashton down and to this award ceremony? I mean, you've been so shortlisted. So we went in this huge auditorium on the South Bank with all the BBC and pro all the B&Q filmmakers. And they were showing everybody's film. And it always came up really grainy compared to all the high definition stuff. And we won it. We won it against them because they said it was the most true, authentic one. So we had a lot of communications. That was very important, keep communicating. So um, we've actually... Um, We've actually realised that we could, we could, after three years, we were getting much more than 20% by behaviour change. And so the community then said to, said to us, could we start doing renewables? Which is, we wanted that. We wanted the community to ask us rather than suggest it. So we started looking at uh, how we could do renewables. Um, and we got an £86,000 fund to look at a microgrid. We, we, we wanted to use our own wire, the, the network wires in the village to put our power into it. And we were helped by Scottish Power Energy Networks to do that. They, were, they offered us the network, which was unusual. Um, and we eventually won a £400,000 grant under the Low Carbon Communities Challenge to install a combined heat and power system uh, in the village. But actually, we won it at the time um, the, the Conservatives just got elected. And it was a, they were elected in May, and they had to have this uh, referendum on money, or audit, moratorium on spending so they said you've got your four hundred thousand pound grant but it's got to go through a six month process and we'll find out after six months if you can have the cash so we're six months later we get the cash and we said do we have a year to spend it they said no you've got to spend it in six months and we said you can't build a chp plant in six months he said no you can't we said so can we do something else he said okay then so we actually ended up putting pv on a, on a particular on a new field but that was very frustrating for us because we never then used the microgrid concept we developed one of the interesting things about the local council was they were never really got involved, actually. It wasn't like Peter's council were coming forward. They were sort of watching us and in quick. But then one day they said, can we help you with this project? We really, we really want to support you. And we said, we want to support us. Build us a footpath to the railway station because you can't actually walk there safely 
uh, about half a mile. Oh, well, they said, we can't do that, they said, because uh, nobody's died on that road, and so we can't justify a footpath. <laughs> and, 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 and just that week, by pure coincidence, we had Sky Television coming to do a report on what we were doing in Ashton. And I'd said to Sky, would you come and interview the head of the council about what they're doing for us? So I told the head of the council, and Sky was going to come and see them. Before Sky arrived, they'd approve the footpath. <laughs> 75,000 pounds. And that was the power of the media, which is really useful to us. I must move on because I'm going to run short of time. Um, so, we built we built this, this. This is we now have an energy company. This is a low carbon pavilion we built, um, and the panels on it. We also have this part of the school rebuilt, and we put PV on that, and we got a community electric car. What started to develop then was very interesting. We were succeeding in very very new various things, and then the shop, the village shop, was not doing very well, and the community got together, a bunch of different people got together and we bought the community shop as a community. We now own the shop, it's been fantastic. At the same time, we've always wanted a recreation field. Another bunch of people said, why don't we do that as well? So we've now bought a recreation field which just won the QE2 award for best recreation field in Britain. Um, so you've got suddenly this cons the community's attitude has transformed from being one of waiting for the council to do stuff to us doing stuff. And now from social enterprise, we earn more money from social enterprise in action than we do from the parish precepts. So now we all every year decide what we're going to do with this cash, which is very empowering. And we're now in the middle of buying the pub. We've, we've formed a new thing to buy the pub, and we're, we're, we're about to set up our sustainable development company in the village. So people have really got into this. Um, the car didn't work because it was a great car, a beautiful Nissan Leaf. I think they're, br I think they're brilliant. But it the dashboard looked like the dashboard of Star Starship Enterprise. So when we tried to do it as a community car, people sat in it, immediately switched it on and said, I can't drive this. <laughs> and got to, so we actually only got about, we needed about 40 people to be members. We only got about 20. And eventually we had to sell the car, which is really sad. Uh, so that was a failure. We, and we learned a lot about that. People started putting their own PV panels on. We were discussing things. And we had a rule that you shared what your knowledge. So anybody who puts panels on shares with neighbours what's going on. Um, so the essentials have been lots of meetings. We always had a lo uh, lot of meetings and we often asked people with big houses if they would hold a meeting because we realised people like coming to people's and uh, have a look around their houses. <laughs> so we thought if you can get a big house, we had cheese and wine from the money we got from the business. Um, we were very inclusive. We said, you can do what you like, as little or as much as you want. Um, we always measured progress. We were scientific, but we wanted to know what we were doing. And we collaborated with anybody who wanted to. And the key thing was having lots of fun. We always have lots of fun with this. And I think that's been the great thing about it. It's not seen as hard work. It's seen as fun. <coughs> OK. Connections are important. Um, business connections. Uh, we had even 15 generals came from across Europe. To we thought it was a joke, actually. But they, they rang us up and said, we want to come from across Europe. We think the Third World War will be based on climate change. Can we come and talk to you? <laughs> well, we thought, this is great. We also <laughs> met the, um, the pub also. Um, every time people came, we insisted they had lunch at the pub. So we were bringing business to the pub. And then we had other companies. And the University of Chester has kept on with us all this time. It's been brilliant. So we had this smart grid project. Um, we now uh, Scottish Power Energy Networks, as the DNO, has, has spent a quarter of a million pound uh, monitoring the village in four quadrants, and now tells us our energy use every five minutes. So that's what we've done. We've only generated three percent of our renewals, but saved twenty percent on our energy. Um, we, we're learning a lot to date. But what happened well on the way when we came to the renewables and came to doing sort of bigger stuff? We found people were ignoring us at that time, and we worked regarded as a little community. So I was quite involved in founding this charity called Leapfrog, which um, is basically a London-based, city-based charity of lawyers who want to do something about climate change but don't want to give up the day job. Right. So they, they give 30% of their time free, and Leapfrog helps communities that need environmental lawyers or accountants or marketing people. So they have like a dragon's den every month, and projects come to them, such as Teddington Hydro. I'm not sure Isle of Egg did. Did you do anything with Isle of Egg? Do anything with Leapfrog? Um, and so they've now got 65 projects that get free legal advice and help. Uh, and that's Im Im impressive when you go to a bank or you go to somewhere else. They, they help us. And you get exactly the same contract as you do as a paying customer, just with a zero price tag. 
Um, so overall, we had 61 households in common throughout all the surveys. So we used that. And you can see that we had a, a, a quite a lot of um, energy reduction in the home. About a third of people stopped taking flights, particularly people in business who went back to work and said, I'm in this community, what can you do? And they started doing more telecoms for them so they could reach... One, one family had a spike so high that the easiest way to reduce our carbon footprint was to evict the family for the village. <laughs> and, and, um, but that guy went back to work and said, can we... And they changed the way they worked, which is better for the family as well, actually. So um, when it came to planning and all this, we, we had a, a system from Carbon Link for it. Um, we found that a web, we went to a web-based survey called Villages Without Borders, and people wouldn't fill in web-based surveys. Sitting with them in the lounges was really important. And the, and the car, as I mentioned, didn't really work. People motivated themselves. This is uh, one of these diagrams where you find out motivation. Recently, it's been saving energy, but before it was more like grandchildren and they're seeing things growing sooner. Um, and this is, we did a, we've done a lot of work surveying people, and why do people do get involved and do it? Well, it's because they feel like the community action is best. It's a democratic project. Every month we report to the Paris Council. If they don't like it, they can stop it. And there's a feeling of pride. Um, and we've done some major surveys on the website you can download about all the residents. We spent a year talking to residents who didn't participate initially, but found they were doing many of them doing more than the people who participated. Um, so, the community energy company now earns money for us. The Paris Council um, is of course facilitates this, and all our, our social enterprises are asset locked to the Paris Council. If they fail, the Paris Council takes over them. So, we've got the community energy company now, which is providing so much income that we maintain all the recreation field with the income from the sort of PV generation, and it has we have surplus. Um, usual thing, directors. And we now, have, we now have surplus that we're going to use to put PV on the roofs of some old folks' houses, and they're going to get free energy uh, from that. We help them with fuel poverty. Um, I think what we've, what we've seen is just the village working together. It's, it's, it's been amazing how it's, we've, it's co made a cohesive uh, thing for the society. And one of the very interesting things is, the I'll quickly mention, the London School of Economics has come to us as the accounting, <coughs> accounting department are studying us because of our eight-year history on our diary of all these meetings. They've ma they're mapping our network of connections within the village and outside the village. And they say this network analysis will throw a lot of light onto what, how a pr project is successful and isn't. And so we've done some seminars with LSE in the village, which is, again, intrigued people who live, who live in Ashton. Um, so we're going to, now we're looking at um, this PV on the social housing for the elderly, but also we're looking at this new technology called Ridgeblade, which is a horizontal wind turbine which hasn't yet got a license for feeding tariffs but we would like to try that out and we've done a deal with a manufacturer to get a cost price one just to do an example of it and we'll see how that works in terms of with no hydro and um, wind we don't really have in position because we have a, a height restriction because we're near the airport um, I think I think um, that's probably it actually I think I've, I've gone over my time but basically, there's lots of things on the website, the Carbon Neutral website, um, Carbon Leapfrog. There. I do have examples later of what Carbon Leapfrog does if anybody wants to ask questions. But you know, feel free to ask questions later. Okay, thank you.